Hello, dear listener. My name is Rose Gothop, and I am the director and one of the writers of this audio drama. And I would like to welcome you to the fourth season of the Wessex dramas called The Well Beloved. I said this wrong in the first episode because one brain cell, so I'm going to try and get this right. This is the first season in our seaside trilogy of Hardy novels. Now, this is ironically the second trilogy, but that doesn't exactly help anyone, so <laughs> this is the first season in our seaside trilogy, a romance set on the island of Portland, or as Hardy liked to call it, the Isle of Slingers. Just a little update for all of those you've been asking, thank you so much for that. Um, the film that we shot last year, we are currently entering it into competitions, and we've been selected for screening at the Liftoff Festival. Unfortunately, I cannot attend that, so I will have to update you as I get updates. Uh, we also might be showing our anthology film um, at a few local museums for some fun and interest. I shall have to see how that goes. Again, I'll keep you up to date if anything further and interesting occurs. So anyway, let's pick up our petticoats and shuffle into a comfortable position in the wingback chairs and settle down to observe the frivolity of artists. Uh, to be an artist. On Chesil Beach, underneath the Lerret, it's daytime. The rain thunders down on the outside of the boat as they run in and throw themselves on a pile of fish netting at the back. Ah! Oh, goodness! The rain! She brushes off moisture from her clothes. Yes, it always rains if you are doing anything, especially outside. I can tell you're not a fisherman. Jocelyn makes a comical half-bow, sweeping off his hat. I thank you, madam. No, I'm trying to make a living as a sculptor. In London, too. Bloomsbury? He shrugs ruefully and half apologetically. Jocelyn gets out his wallet. Bayswater. There. He hands over a note, which Marcia accepts with a smile and a nod. You'll have to spend the night up ahead in the inn at Budmouth, as the next train up won't be till tomorrow. I know, but it'll be too late to take up residence in the inn if we stay here until this stops. They sit and listen to the downpour. Jocelyn slowly shrugs. Well, if you're game to struggle on, I am. Marcia starts to stand up. Jocelyn gets to his feet, offers his hand and pulls her up. <sighs> Come on then. They exit the boat, still holding hands, and are hit by the high winds and the lashing rain. Their hands are torn apart and Marcia totters and almost falls. Jocelyn is forced to get hold of her again, put his arm around her waist and hold fast as they fight their way along the shingled causeway of Chesil Beach into Budmouth, Marcia tying her scarf tightly around her hat. They finally see the little inn ahead and stagger towards it. Budmouth Inn, the kitchen. It's daytime. Jocelyn is half clad in a blanket, drying off by the stove, with his upper clothes over a nearby chair, drying by the fire. A young maid comes in and unceremoniously dumps a pile of Marcia's clothes on another chair at a distance. He goes out, unbothered by the clothes dripping state. Jocelyn concernedly goes over to the pile, selects the blouse and takes it over the fire to dry it. He inhales its perfume, smiles, and then holds it over the fire in the stove. He sees his well-beloved in Marcia as he imagines her as a nereid emerging, dripping from the sea and smiling at him. On a train journey to London, it's daytime. Jocelyn sits opposite to Marcia as they journey to London. Well, my dear Juliet. What? Well, I must be your Romeo, as our two families have a blood feud and all. <laughs> I suppose so. Well? Jocelyn lights up, leans across and takes her hands. He suddenly bursts out. My queenly darling, instead of going to your aunt's, will you marry me instead? Marcia flushes excitedly and looks around herself. Our families have been neighbours on the island for years. You know all about me, my history, my prospects. Marcia muses and then smiles slowly and teasingly. Hmm. But will you ever be a royal academician? I will be, if you will be my wife. You won't need to go home to your disapproving aunt and your angry father then. Marcia leaves go of his hand and leans back dubiously. How long would it take to be married? I will go for a license today, and we could be married tomorrow. You could stay in a hotel, meanwhile. Marcia thinks hard, and then suddenly smiles a little. 
In that case, yes. I shall take a risk on you, sir. Jocelyn jumps over to sit next to her. He takes her in his arms and passionately kisses her face. Marcia pulls away amusedly. She writes her must hair and hat and rolls her eyes. Now, now, we're not married yet. Sorry, Marcia, but I just had to kiss my well-beloved. My muse. She smiles indulgently. Ridiculous boy. London. Summer's studio. It's daytime. Summers, Jocelyn's friend, opens the door to his friend who rushes in excitedly. Summers is wearing an artist's smock and carrying a messy paint palette. He lets his friend in and they go over to a drinks tray in his studio. Oh, hello, Pearson. Awfully glad to see you. Summers looks him up and down. Hmm, you're obviously in some trouble which you expect your long-suffering friend to extricate you from. So... Go on, out with it. Jocelyn withdraws a piece of paper from his pocket and waves it at Summers. No, no trouble. I'm just marrying my well-beloved, that's all. Summers pours, then hands Jocelyn some wine, so Jocelyn replaces the licence in his pocket and takes a slurp. Summers strolls over and then plonks himself down in an old armchair. Oh, one of those little Avis girls you wrote about. Uh, well... No. Um, actually, this is the daughter of a local Portland stone merchant. Well, at least this one will have a decent dowry instead of being a fishwife's daughter. Uh, no. No dowry as she's sort of run away with me. Oh. Jocelyn plonks himself down in another armchair. Well, at least, hopefully, now you'll stop hammering away at lumps of rock to represent your ghastly well-beloved. Anyway, didn't you have another couple of well-beloveds before? Oh, those were a couple of twins we used to see at those soirees. And that Italian woman. And that model. Jocelyn holds his glass up in toast. Yes, well, that's all finished now. To my actual well-beloved. Marcia, whom I'm going to marry. Summers whistles in surprise, raises his eyebrows in light mockery and then raises his toast, smiling. To Marcia. They drink. The private sitting room of a hotel at daytime. Marcia is pouring tea and handing it to Jocelyn, who is still standing up. What? Not tomorrow? No, but we can on Monday, though. Apparently, you have to fulfil the residency requirement before you can marry. Marvellous. You didn't tell me this before, Jocelyn. I didn't know. He sits down near to her on the sofa. She shrugs. Well, either way, I've written to my father to tell him what I've agreed. I should have realised that there would be some problems, though. Sorry, Marcia. Don't worry. We'll soon be married. He smiles encouragingly at her. She looks down. (sighs) Jocelyn's studio in London. Daytime. Jocelyn is sitting sketching Marcia, who is standing, posing, with a sheet draped around her, like a toga, near the window. A household servant knocks, and then comes in with a letter. Mrs Itchin says, Owls, you've got a letter, sir. She hands the letter to Jocelyn, nods, and marches out. Thank you. He opens it. Sir, I have just sent off my refusal to the marriage of my daughter to her hotel. I now send this to let you know also that she will not receive a penny of her diary and I consider the idea of a marriage into the family of a certain commercial concern in Portland to be totally beyond the pale. Faithfully, J. Benkham. Oh. Oh. He looks up at Marcia and smiles ruefully. It's a no from your father. Marcia drops her pose and rushes over, snatching the letter from him. She reads it. What? Not a wretched penny? She throws it down. Oh, for goodness sake. Don't worry. We can... She turns away, cuts off his answer with an abrupt wave of her hand and walks away to the window. Jocelyn smiles painedly at her. A park in London. 
It's daytime. Jocelyn and Marcia are walking along arm in arm. And then you can keep your home and... Lord, really? I may be a native of Slingers, but I haven't actually spent my life breaking stones. Stones? Uh, there's such a thing as servants, you know. Oh, yes. Um, in time, we'll probably get a little maid or so and... Oh, a servant. How charming. And we could probably afford, in a little while, some sort of nursemaid for when all the children come along. Oh, what do you think I am? A cow? Some sort of breeding machine? She withdraws her arm and walks faster, away from him. Well, I, I thought we'd have a family and... Oh, yes. Twenty brats in a pokey flat above an artist's studio. Jocelyn pulls level and eyes her askance. Marcia, I can't help being a sculptor. I thought that my well-beloved would want to help me in our push through life. Um, yes, haha, <laughs> as a slave of all work. She turns her head away and walks on even faster. Marcia's bedroom in the hotel. Marcia is throwing clothes into a suitcase, getting them out of drawers and wardrobes as she moves about hurriedly. Jocelyn stands by helplessly. Marcia! Just wait, please. He puts his hand on top of hers. She quickly withdraws it. Look, Jocelyn, first it was marriage in a day, then it was marriage in a week, then there was no money, and finally there is the increasingly alarming spectacle of your wanting me to be your domestic slave. But, beloved... She hurls some bloomers at his face where they stick. Oh, knickers to your well-beloved... I'm going home. Forget it. Jocelyn sadly removes the offending bloomers from his face. Various places in London. It is daytime. A montage. Jocelyn works at his sculpting in the studio. He is sculpting some draped legs at the bottom of a tall, rectangular stone block. Jocelyn is having a drink in Summer's studio with his friend. Jocelyn is sketching in the park. Jocelyn is showing three clients a smallish statue of a classical woman. The clients are walking around it, nodding and admiring it while he talks. The living area of Jocelyn's studio. It's daytime. Jocelyn is eating his breakfast and opens a letter from home. He reads it. The letter is from his father. And as I told you, son, don't worry if you want to get away for a while and learn new things. You had a narrow escape there from doing a very foolish thing. The Benscombs think only of money and would have devoured you alive. The only real piece of news I have to send this week is that that little Avis Carroll has gone and married Jim Weston's son who has just set up his own fishing business. Her mother is not too happy with yet more fish in the family, but she's glad that Avis got over you in the end. Write back and tell me how you go, Jocelyn, with affection from your father. Jocelyn lowers the letter to the table, stares out of the window and sighs. Summer's studio. It's daytime. Jocelyn and Summer's are sitting, drinking and talking. Why Rome? Really? What a question. It only happens to have half of the world's greatest works of statutory in one place. I need inspiration for my own masterpiece. Ugh, not that well-beloved again. What else? Have you ever thought that you will be deserting your friend and leaving him to the predatory ministrations of London womanhood? Predatory? My dear Summers, predation presupposes that you have anything for them to prey upon. Not only is there my admittedly small paternal stipend and, of course, my handsome self, but there is the promise of a future art collection of unsurpassing value. Jocelyn put his empty glass down, stands up and puts his hand on his friend's shoulders. That's the thing, Summers. Positive thinking. Positive thinking, old chap. Summers waves him away with his fingers, good-humouredly. I shall get my revenge on your desertion by taking long, free holidays with you, you know. Jocelyn smiles 
and leaves. I'll be delighted to see you, old man. Do drop round as well, before I leave at the weekend. Summers nods and smiles. Rome. It is daytime. A montage. Jocelyn dismounts from the small cart full of luggage which is being driven by a tatty Italian carter. Jocelyn walks swiftly up a steep grassy rise and stops at the top. He looks down on the vast city of Rome. Jocelyn, now in his late twenties, hammers away at the hip area of a draped female statue in his large Roman studio. The upper portion of the statue is still only a block of stone. Jocelyn, now in his early thirties, approaches, looks up and then goes into a Roman hotel. Jocelyn, now 39, is sketching in a Roman garden. Jocelyn, who is now an established sculptor and dressed more urbanely, not in his work clothes, is showing two very well-dressed couples a small statue in his atelier. The visitors are in awe of the great man. On the train, it is daytime. A well-dressed Jocelyn sits watching the landscape go by on the train back to London. It is 1887. Summer's Flat, daytime. Summer's Flat is much fuller with completed pictures. It's also rather fuller of tattier belongings as well. The stuffing is coming out of one armchair. Summer's now 40 years old and in high good humour, is leading Jocelyn away from the door towards the armchairs and drinks table. Jocelyn doesn't sit down, shakes his head, but then grabs his jaw in pain. No, I'm not stopping, Summers. I just called to ask if you wanted to come down with me to Slingers for a couple of months or so. I'm renting Sylvania Castle. Good grief. You're going it, man. Did your dad leave you well off, then? Or is it your clients? Both, I suppose. My dear old dad turned out to be quite surprisingly, um, comfortable. Sorry I couldn't get to the funeral, old chap. No, it's all right. But can you come, though? I have to race off to see the dentist now. Ugh. Oh, I'd love to. But I'm just starting a big painting for a commission. I don't get many of those, so I can't afford to say no. I can't afford to drag the entire studio down there for this huge canvas. Jocelyn nods and sets back off to the door, cradling and massaging his sore jaw tenderly. All right, Summers. But I'm down there if you can get away, or finish early type thing. Summers follows him to the door, which Summers opens. Thanks, old thing. Awfully glad you're back, as well as my now having a... Famous friend. Well done, eh? Jocelyn smiles and shrugs self-deprecatingly. Summers punches him playfully on his shoulder and Jocelyn recoils in pain, clutching his jaw again. Ah! The Isle of Slingers at Sylvania Castle. It is daytime. Jocelyn arrives at his rented castle in a gig. He gets down, pays the driver and then regards his accommodation. The driver leaves as Jocelyn stands there. An elderly, black-clad female housekeeper comes down the steps to greet him, along with an old man who takes Jocelyn's bags. All three exchange words and then go up the steps into the castle. The terrace of Sylvania Castle. It is daytime. Jocelyn sits on the terrace, sipping his wine with a book on his knee. He looks at the scenery below, it's a beautiful day on the Isle of Slingers. On the beach, it is daytime. Jocelyn is sketching a sea view standing at his easel when a young woman of around 19, Avis too, comes into view carrying a basket of clothes. She stops and watches him. Jocelyn turns his head towards her and is struck by her auburn hair and her beauty. He sees his well-beloved in the lineaments of her face. Hello. Hello. Why are you painting the sea? What else would you paint around here? It's a bit boring. I mean, it's either flat or choppy. Ah, oh, but the light. The light. Well, yes. 
I suppose it's either light or dark. You don't paint other things, then? Well, pretty young maids when they'll sit for me. He looks interrogatively at her, and she considers. How much? A pound a morning. Where? At Sylvania Castle. Suppose I could do Tuesday and Saturday mornings. You a painter, then? Amongst other things, yes. Uh, Avis? She looks surprised. How did you know? Jocelyn smiles. How many Avises were there in your class in school? Oh, eleven. They both laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That was an episode of The Well Beloved. We would like to thank our editor, Liam MacArthur, for his fabulous skills and ear for editing. I'd also like to thank our amazing cast, Alban O'Brien, Peter Allison, Scott Monroe, Annalena Gaggiano, Caro Joy, Olivia Watson, Robin Lee, Izzy Joy, John Simpson, Catherine Dyer, Mark Joy, Tony Lee and John Seal. You can find us on YouTube under Rose Gold of Films. We are on Spotify and the Thomas Hardy website, as well as our own website, The Daily Dilettante. If you want more updates on what's happening with our podcast, follow Rose Goldthorpe on Instagram and Facebook or sign up for our newsletter. Thank you again so much for all your hard work and support and kindness, and see you next time. <laughs>